So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, our fifth speakers event of Michaelmas term. Uh, we've heard from tennis superstars, White House insiders, leaders of the law, and today we turn to a legend of the acting world. Dame Diana Rigg is acting royalty. Since her debut in York in 1957, she's graced the West End, Broadway, a James Bond film, Extras, and Game of Thrones. She's won BAFTAs and Tony's galore and is currently appearing in hit ITV drama, Victoria. So without further ado, Dame Diana. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Perfect. And I suppose first things first, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and coming up to, to Cambridge. Is, is this your first time in Cambridge? Have you been here a couple of times in the past? Or? Um, no, I haven't been here before. Okay. No. No, so I think I've, first uh, time, which I is good. I thought what a good idea it was uh, yeah. to learn something about the world from you guys. So I suppose we will get stuck in straight away and thinking about your acting career because you, you've, you've had success over such a long period in so many different things, so many different shows on the stage, in film. I mean, but what, what's changed so much? So mo uh, what's changed the most? So I, know I, I saw you, you were nominated for an Emmy in both 1967 and 2015. So what, what's changed the most in sort of the industry in that time, if that makes I sense. I think the, um, you can all hear me, can you? Yes? Good. I think uh, um, the, the preparation for the stage has changed hugely, because when I was young, there were sort of stages that you went through, and um, I was um, an ASM in rep for really quite a long time, which was absolutely fascinating, because it, uh, you learnt from as it were, watching. And that is really quite an important part of learning. Um, I was not a particularly good ASM, but it was absolutely fascinating because nowadays uh, everything is done uh, electronically and it's all computerized and everything, but you're going to hear this quite a lot now, uh, this evening. In my day, <laughs> um, I, you sat in the prompt corner, you had the prompt book on your lap, the rope was there to bring the curtain up or bring the curtain down, there was um, a, a, a board, which was the Alex board there, and you could see from the script a lighting change was coming up, so you'd switch down for um, caution, and then switch down for red for go. It was, you were incredibly busy. And then behind would be something called the panotrope, which was um, a record player. And you could set the needle at various sounds. So there would be car approaching, car leaving, door slamming, and all that kind of stuff, or for whatever music that was required. And I remember they had, um, uh, they had an Agatha Christie play on, and. I, I, was, I, was, I was so, so keen as an ASM, but obviously one makes mistakes, and it was supposed to be, the final curtain call was supposed to be um, the ride of the Valkyries, instead of which it was Jimmy Shand and his dancing dustman, <laughs> and the entire um, cast didn't speak to me for a week. <laughs> but those were the days when um, you toured, and as you toured, you learnt, um, and it was wonderfully democratic uh, because you were all in it together. Yeah. Now people become stars almost on their first job, no matter how young mm. and inexperienced they are. And to be perfectly honest, and I don't wish to sound pompous, but I grieve for them because they have nothing to fall back on at all if the worst comes to the worst and if their careers don't um, develop. And stage work, I always recommend, if any of them ask me what paths to take in their lives in the future, I always tell them that the stage 
is the most faithful of audiences. They're the ones who remember, and they're the ones who will come back and back and back to mm -hmm. see you. So to secure yourself, go back to the stage. Any of you who are thinking of going into the theater. And again, in, in my day, NMD, I'm going to cut it short now. Um, I think I was the first generation where people straight from the university joined us. And, there was, and, and the people who'd been around for years, not, not I, I hasten to add, but the actors and actresses, you know, who'd spent years in the theatre, were really sniffy about the university people who joined us and the directors who joined us who hadn't actually, uh, um, you know, paid their dues. But you, for over the years, the universities have oh, wonderfully, wonderfully uh, uh, um, fed into my profession. End of that question. <laughs> so I, I suppose so you went from the stage then on to TV with, with the Avengers, obviously most famously. Did, which do you prefer? So you said you, you would always, there's always the option to go back to the stage. But do you prefer being on uh, TV, being on the stage, or no, even film? No, no, I film? prefer the stage every yeah. time, because it's absolutely wonderful. I mean, <clears throat> again, at the risk of being pompous, it is a kind of communion, because the, the audience comes to believe. And we have the responsibility to, to, to fulfill that belief, uh, and to not cut, any, cut, cut their belief short in any way at all. Um, so an audience, I think, is the purest response a live audience is the purest response to your performance. Um, so I went from, um, I played Shakespeare for, for, for five years and, and, uh, under Peter Hall. And then he decided that the um, repertoire should be broadened and he took the Aldwych Theatre in London to, for the World Shakespeare to do uh, modern plays. And from there, I was sort of plucked to do the Avengers. And I remember, um, again, if, interesting, that another reversal, that they were terribly sniffy about me becoming going on television. I was definitely lowering the tone. And it has now changed so completely. And I remember Peter Hall said, yes, well, she's, 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 she's a good young actress, but she's wasting herself in television. Yeah, and I mean, um, I, I suppose, what, what's, been, what's been your favorite part to play on the stage? Do you, do you have a sort of preferred, or even a preferred Shakespeare? Do you, do you have no, a preferred Shakespeare? No, I, I have, um, Medea was the favorite part, mm. because it had a trajectory that was so perfect. And it's what should happen to every good piece of theatre. Um, we started at the Almeida. Um, Jonathan Kent, uh, he asked, I, I think he was a Greek scholar to, to translate Medea. And the Almeida, of course, is a very small um, theatre. It does good work, but, but it, it, I think it's about 250. Anyway, we opened, we had wonderful notices. And nobody picked it up to take it into the West End. They were all really frightened of this 2,000-year-old play, and they thought, no, that's it, you know, good, good, good effort on their part, and that's that. But Jonathan Kent and I got together, and I remember, um, we, I remember saying to him, I can, I can smell it, which is an odd phrase to use about theater, but it's got, it's got more life, it's, it's got a longer life. So we then went to see a producer and persuaded him to put it back on. This producer pretended he'd seen it. We knew he hadn't. <laughs> um, and, uh, but he did, bless him, he, 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 he remounted it. In order, and, but he made us tour for a very long time before bringing us into the West End. And it was very interesting when we toured, because I remember Newcastle. Absolutely nobody came to the first couple of nights. And then gradually it built and it built and it built. And then we were playing to full houses by the Saturday night. And this happened all over the country. Finally, we came in to the West End, to Wyndham's Theatre, which is a small theatre. 
And again, not much expectation, but we got wonderful notices. And so suddenly we were playing to full houses. And then somebody came over, saw it, and thought it would work on Broadway. And suddenly we were playing or went out to play on Broadway. And suddenly we were sellout. And suddenly there was a lady at the box office saying, you got to sell me a ticket. I know the author. <laughs> <laughs> And it was the most wonderful experience. And I, I wanted Euripides up in lights. And I asked the producers if they'd do it. And they said no, because it would put people off. And I said, no, it won't. I'll pay for it. I was prepared to pay. For it. I didn't care. I wanted him up there 2,000 years later. Mm. But he never got there, poor old bugger. But anyway, <laughs> that's why I love Medea because of the history, because of the belief behind it, and because a Greek play that old can speak to audiences in the 21st century. Yeah, and I suppose you, you said that was, was sort of the perfect part, and, and would you say that's what defines being the perfect part, being able to connect with people, I suppose? Yes, I mean, who would have thought it? A, 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 Fiercely jealous woman who kills her children. <laughs> um, yes, but, but what was so fascinating about, I mean, I had played other Greeks uh, uh, um, before. You know, I love that American phrase, I've done that. <laughs> no, but I'd, uh, I'd played Phaedra before uh, uh, and got it wrong. And um, the wonderful thing about Medea is that the women in those days, you probably, you, you probably know far more than I do about this, some of you who are studying. They, they, they did believe in, the, not just the women, they believed in predestination. And Euripides wrote the first play about a woman who said, no, I'm not accepting that. I am forming, I am making my own life. And I think in a way that's what, that's, mm. that's, that's the thread that appealed to the 21st century audience. And I suppose that that provides quite an interesting way to, to look back at your time in the 60s because to a certain extent you by by playing Emma Peel in the Avengers you were playing a, the, one of the first female characters on TV to take that attitude to stand up but yes but not that the script writers knew it <laughs> um, it had started as, as, a, as a two-man show uh, it was uh, an actor called Ian Hendry and Pat McNee. And Ian dropped out, and um, uh, they cast a woman, but they didn't change the script. And so suddenly she was doing all those things that males did, and suddenly it was a huge success. Um, and it was Anna Blackman who did that, uh, uh, and I took over from Anna. And the script writers were rubbing their hands in glee because everybody was clapping them on the back and saying, you know, how clever they'd been, but not at all. <laughs> so, and, and you were sort of thrust into success in, in the middle of the 60s, weren't you? So what, what, was it, what was it like to be sort of in, in the 60s, if we sort of in, inverted commas? Oh, it was good news. <laughs> it was seriously good news, particularly if you came from Yorkshire and had gone to Moravian school. Do you know about Moravians? They're sort of Czechoslovakian Quakers. Um, and they buried women on the one side and men on the other, or they used to. Anyway, it was very, very prim and proper. And if you said you wanted to be an actress, as I did to my headmistress, um, it was almost as if I was claiming that I was going to take to the streets. <laughs> uh, but the 60s was very good uh, for women, particularly. So many doors were just sort of, they, they weren't broken open, they just creaked open of their own accord. Um, and and f to be uh, uh, recognized was fine. I was ill-equipped to deal with it. Uh, um, nowadays, I think people know all about how to be a star. I didn't have a clue. I got this enormous amount of fan mail which just destroyed me because I felt so guilty I wasn't doing anything with them so I had a mini I used to drive around in a mini and I used to put all the fan mail in the boot of the mini 
um, because I couldn't, I didn't have a secretary. I, 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 finally, I got my mother to come on board and to answer the fan mail, which she did in a most robust fashion. <laughs> She'd write back and say, my daughter's far too old for you. <laughs> Or she'd say, what you need is a good run round the block. <laughs> and to this day, there are hundreds of photographs all over the world signed by my mother. <laughs> Stardom has taken on a, a, a different form now, and I think it's far more intrusive. And it's, 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 a, it's a grotesque, greedy giant that has a... a, a, a a hard case of indigestion and spits people out very quickly, which is cruel. And we, we witness it all the time. And, and did you, well, it, it wasn't like that in the 60s or just No, or just it, was in much, less it was much slower and, 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 and not so intrusive. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it was slightly shocking. It, it, I mean, I'm quite a private person, so mm. d d d d there was an intrusion, but it was nothing like it is now, yeah. nothing. No, not at all. And, and obviously, you, you went on uh, to be probably one, one of one of the, those great roles in being a Bond girl in in, in the sixties. How, how how was that? Was that an interest? Because obviously, you, you weren't you weren't a typical Bond girl in that. Uh, no, they got me on board because they wanted me to. I was the gravitas yeah. to um, what's his name? La Lazenby. 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 Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they had to have an actress on board because Lazenby was, was totally inexperienced um, and so that's why I got I mean I have no illusions at all that's why they got me um, and I did what I could I did the best I could but, but um, he just he, he oh dear lord he had a perfectly good chance and he wasn't bad was he in the film I don't think I think he was perfectly good. Yeah. It was just that he was impossible to deal with. And so the, um, the producers said not again and, and, and got rid of him. Isn't that sad? Oh. <laughs> so, see, th I mean, that is a classic example of somebody who doesn't know how to deal with fame and got it wrong. Yeah. No, that, I, I have to say, it was, I mean, the money was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from where I'd come mm. from, where, oh yes, what we haven't touched on is that while I was at the, in, in the Avengers, I, I discovered, very much in the light of what's happening today, I discovered there I was, um, you know, mm. Mm, in a two-hander with Pat McNee, and I was getting less than the cameraman. Um, and I made a bit of a fuss about this. I didn't frankly know how much I was worth, to be perfectly honest, but I knew I was worth more than the cameraman for a start. <laughs> and so I made a bit of a fuss and I, there was, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the reaction to it was what a mercenary person I was and tut tut and all the rest of it. Anyway, um, I pressed rewind to Bond and here we are earning pots of money and um, it was profligate. I, th I think probably it was the last of, of those films where MNO, money, no object. And um, I looked at the watch once for about 10 seconds in the, um, in the film. And we were filming in, in Switzerland and they sent down, we were up on Muren, and they sent down to Interlaken for a watchmaker to come up and uh, for me to choose a watch. He opened up all these watch cases and I went, mm. And then they gave me the watch. It was wonderful. I mean, coming from Shakespeare and um, eight pounds a week, it was absolutely terrific. <laughs> but but you, you, you still do prefer the, the, the theatrical side yeah, to that. Yeah, I much that. prefer yeah. theatre. I much prefer it. I mean, it's live. Mm. Now... Uh, uh, with with filming and certainly, I mean, I, I'm I'm not in Game of Thrones anymore. But Game of Thrones is really quite extraordinary because you can be in a two-hander, and uh, you'll do 26 takes. And I, I 
always say to the director, I'm the law of diminishing returns. <laughs> After three, I'm bored and hopeless. <laughs> so please don't take me there. But they do because they have to. Because somewhere between the, the, the set and the editing are, are the money men, are the producers. Everybody wants to say, give them 26 takes to fight over. And it's the, it's the end of, of joy, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So I suppose you, you've, you've been involved in three big sort of cult uh, phenomena in that you were part of the Avengers. Uh, you've mentioned Game of Thrones and, and you, you've mentioned Bond. So you, you've sort of experienced that, that fandom, I suppose. Uh, how, how has that changed? Has, has that sort of cult nature of Game of Thrones, is that similar to that cult nature of the Avengers or is it? I don't know. I, I truly don't know because I, I keep a very low profile for the most part. I'm, 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 I'm not very good on the red carpet. In fact, I don't hardly know the red carpet. The red carpet wouldn't know me if I stepped on it. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I, I really, I can't no. answer that. No, I have no... Sense. Do you mean <laughs> Game of Thrones fans are more bizarre than any other? <laughs> Perhaps I'm, I'm one myself, so I don't know. <laughs> you have to ask my, my friends about that. But uh, uh, so, since, since you have mentioned Game of Thrones, I, yeah. I, I will go on to it. Uh, <laughs> so how much further do you want me to go? <laughs> Well, you, you did uh, give it a yes, and, and you did also talk about um, shooting scenes in it, and I just wanted to ask you, what, what, what do you think has been the most enjoyable scene to film? So I, I read somewhere you were talking about the scenes being brilliantly written and being meaty and enjoyable to play. I mean, your, your, your final one, how, how, how was that like to film? What did you know? It's so interesting. I don't... Mm, this sounds as if I'm being... Uh, just revolting. I'm playing the modest card. Well, I'm not. I don't watch myself because it's agony. You sit there and think, oh, fuck, I could have done so much. <laughs> um, uh, so I didn't see the final scene and it wasn't until afterwards that everybody told me it was absolutely terrific. That's nice to know if it's your final scene. I mean, glad I didn't bog it. Uh, um, but... but I, I do remember filming it, and I do remember, I mean, I remember learning it and everything. I think it was a one-taker. Really? Either one or two. It definitely wasn't the 26, because it wouldn't have been any good if it no. was the 26. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'd have been bored by that time. No. Uh, anyway, so the point being, I am dependent, utterly dependent on the script. Yeah. Nobody can elevate a bad script. Mm. Nobody can uh, 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 rise above a bad script. So the script was good. I saw it. I knew... Oh, there's a one... I'm, I'm diverting now. Sarah Bernhardt, an old actress, wrote about... I look over the piece... And if it is in nature, I know it can be played. And I remember that all the time. This scene was in nature, and I could play it, and it was easy to play. Yeah. So there was no great uh, pain in playing it. It was yeah. beautifully written, in nature, and zippity doo -dah. Yeah. Because it, it, it really... In, in terms of it being a sort of an I iconic part, did, do you have any sort of fav favourite lines? Any any sort of nope, don't most remember a thing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> ask it. Do, do you think in, in terms? You said you really enjoyed doing the Medea yeah. and, and the part. Do you think there were similarities between your character? And God no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although my husband had just left me. Truly. I've stunned you all. <laughs> no, no, my, my husband had just gone walkabout, and, mm. um, and Medea was offered me, and I thought, right! Yeah. <laughs> no, um, and, and, and one more question, I suppose, about Game of Thrones. 
<laughs> but, but it's a good one. So it's, uh, somebody did send this in to me. Um, the hat. What hat? So, so you, you, you had the, the oh, headdress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, um, somebody was asking me, uh, wh when did that come into play? Was it, I did wish you? it hadn't. Oh. <laughs> it was a nightmare. Um, uh, I, it came into play uh, right at the beginning. Uh, and what happens is that um, I hate, well, at my age, it's pointless sitting in a makeup chair and expecting miracles. Pointless. So I say to the makeup lady, you've got 15 minutes. <laughs> and I'm out. Yeah. So I have to cover as much as possible, including the hair, and as much of the face as possible. Okay. Frankly, I'd pay... Yeah. I'd wear a burqa if I could, but there you go. <laughs> um, so that's how that started. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, and I, I'm, I'm sure Nancy will be happy if she's in the audience. Uh, so I suppose before, before we move on to um, questions from the floor, um, you, you're off to Broadway now, is that, is that right? I'm off to Broadway, yeah. But so. uh, in... Um, February, yes. I've been offered um, Mrs. Higgins in a re revival of My Fair Lady um, on Broadway, which should be fun. And I want to know why if it isn't. Um, and the, I played Eliza a thousand years ago. It's a wonderful part. Frankly, I think uh, uh, it's the best play that Shaw ever wrote. Anybody studying Shaw here? No. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, I think it was, it was Tom Stoppard who said, Shaw didn't write characters, he wrote animated points of view, which is really true when you think about it. Anyway, I played Eliza, and then I played Mrs. Higgins uh, um, in, a, in a straight play, and now I'm playing Mrs. Higgins in the musical. When I was playing Eliza, and this is the joy of theatre, um, the lady who was playing Mrs. Higgins had worked for and knew Shaw. So there's a sort Amazing. of continuum there, which I love about the theatre. Oh, fantastic. And, and, and you're really looking forward to going back to Broadway? Yeah, yeah, it'd be great. And, uh, it's, it's, Why not? They spoil you there. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I said a, a final question, but I, I do have one, one final question. Um, what, what, what would you say to a younger you, looking, looking back now. So you, you've been through a remarkable career, you've been on the stage, you've been on screen. Do, do you have any sort of advice you'd give to somebody like yourself who's, who's starting out? Um... Well, I, 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 I don't give advice. I really don't. There's, there's people, you, you know, um, it's easy to give advice, and it's easy to be an elder stateswoman or whatever, whatever. And I don't go there, not because I don't want to help, no. but because you've got to learn for yourself. You just have to learn for yourself. And the advice I'd give to my younger self, if, if I knew her, was, dear, thank God you don't know how lucky you're going to be, because I would have been insufferable. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note... Uh, Thank you very much, uh, to Diana, for that conversation. Questions there. from the floor? Yeah, so we'll take some questions. Does anyone have a question? Amazing. Can I ask the woman in, in the second row if that's okay? And then we'll get around. Thank you, that's absolutely brilliant. Now, can I ask you, are we going to see you in the next series of Victoria? <laughs> yes, oh, there's a Christmas special. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I think they're, they're, doing, they're doing others. But I'm having such fun on that. Oh, <laughs> such fun. Just be old and naughty. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask one more question? Yes, of course. What are your interests and hobbies outside of the acting world? Oh, so much. Mm. The thing is, um, everything. I, I, I read as much as I can. I travel a lot um, uh, because I love uh, other cultures. Um, I'm curious about just about, I love learning. I'm teaching myself Spanish now. Um, I, yes, listen. I can teach you of such a useful word. Oxidado, which is Spanish for rusty. <laughs> Spanish for rusty. 
And I confound oxidado. people by saying I'm a bit oxidado. That's oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> you know, I mean, life I'm is that, terrific. And I would urge all you guys, whatever you're studying, it's not enough. Study outside, study beyond, be interested in everything you possibly can be, because that's what life is about. I love exhibitions, art. It's, it's here. Take it with both hands. Perfect. Um, any other questions? We'll go to uh, the third row, uh, the man. So, no, just in front of him. Perfect. Uh, I must be one of the few people in the chamber who grew up with you um, playing Emma Peel in the You Avengers. must have been a boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was obviously a great success and made you famous, and yet you've already alluded to issues about dealing with fame and issues about pay from ABC, being paid less than the cameramen. I've also read that you thought that Patrick McNee was your only friend on set. Um, 50 years later, how do you reflect on the Avengers? Do you have happy memories, or were you glad to leave? No, the point about the Avengers was I owe them it a very great deal, and I have never, never, never turned my back on it in that respect. Everything. I could have played, you know, for 25 more years in Shakespeare and not had the recognition that I got out of one season on the Avengers at all. But the, the point about the Avengers was that I, in a way, I had, to, I had to be disloyal leaving it. I had to turn my back on absolutely anything that approached an approximation of the Avengers in order to prove that I was capable of playing and developing other things. So in a sense, I had to be disloyal in order to carve another career out for myself because the pressures to remain within that very small world were huge. Um, no, on that side, Matt over there. Right. Thank you. Um, if I can just touch on what you were saying earlier about um, about fame and, and how difficult it is uh, today to uh, cope with being a celebrity and to, and to give it up. Um, Jack Gleason, who played King Joffrey in Game of Thrones, did do that. He said, when I'm done with Game of Thrones, I'm going to quit acting, and so far he's followed through with that. Um, is that something that you admire him for? And if you were in his position, do you think you would be able to do the same thing? So sorry, I didn't totally understand what you were saying. So he said, "I am going to uh, quit act." So he's quit. He quit acting when he left Game he of Thrones. He hasn't quit acting. Has he not? Oh, wait a minute! Wait a minute! Yeah. I've got the wrong person. He... <laughs> <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. He has quit acting, and he was very, very good. And um, it was his choice. Uh, and I admire. I admire his, his um, strength of character, because believe you me, the siren song of Game of Thrones stardom was very beguiling. Um, and he was, by the way, an absolutely adorable and charming young man. <laughs> no, I did not lust after him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't go for toy boys <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, just that person there, um, who I'm, I'm pointing at, so sort of, they're directly there in the red, in the red scarf, slash. Uh, thank you. So, as an American, obviously, the Harvey Weinstein scandal has hit Hollywood. Um, and I'd be interested in your perspective over your career, whether or not you thought there were valuable times where you could have said something about directors, um, or just kind of in reflection, um, I know you said you don't give advice, but how you might um, handle some of those situations. Um, oh, I'd give advice on that. <laughs> I wouldn't give advice on, on, on careers, do you know what I mean? But I'd definitely give advice on that, uh, um, which is, you know, walk away. But I, I fully understand the problem that, that young women have. I mean, it, it, it has been dreadful. I also have to say that the, the, the moral rectitude of 
uh, Hollywood suddenly raising its head is quite surprising, isn't it? Because it's been going on for years and everybody's known it's been going on for years. So a slap on the knuckles for that one, I'd say. Nobody agrees with me? How strange. I'm talking about the establishment in Hollywood keeping quiet for so many years. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Incidentally, um, I read, an, I read a, a, a letter in a newspaper recently. Um, it was, a, you know, uh, um, Agony Aunt, and it was a young man writing. He said, I'm in an office with an older lady next opposite me. He said, and every Tuesday she eats her sandwich and then she eats banana in a very, very su suggestive way. <laughs> She's much older than me. And I, I'm very embarrassed, and I blush, and I don't know what to do about this. I thought, how adorable. Suddenly, <laughs> the boot is on the other foot. And the answer was even oh, yeah. better, which was, go out and buy yourself a huge eclair. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's just... <laughs> uh, go, go, I'm going to go back there. Hello. Um, I want to ask, what's, what is easier for, to, uh, for you to play a character that is closer to your personality, to your actual personality, or that is further off from your actual personality? That's a good question, because um, I think the process of finding a character is defining the difference between yourself and it, measuring that difference, measuring that distance, and then covering it. And in order to do that, you've got to know yourself pretty well. And there are some people who are simply not interested in playing characters, and so they play themselves all the time. Well, to pretty good effect. I mean, you know, they're happy, and the audiences are happy and everything. But if you actually, actually want to play the character, that's what you have to do. And you have to go in deep and be brutally honest about yourself and then to merge the two as best you can. And can I, can I just ask, and how, how, how do you do that? How do you get in so deep? Do you have a, do you have a way of going? In? There's a lot of gestation goes on. It's really interesting. Um, uh, um, my daughter's an actress as well, and we sort of talk about this, uh, uh, that you, you've accepted a part and you're learning the lines, and it's you don't just sit down and learn them. They, they sort of recur in your head and you think, oh, how can I do that? How can I, how can I just lift that and that? And there has to be a pause there. And, um, and he actually put a full stop at the end. So that means, and that is your script and then there is the character. And you think in all sorts of terms. You think in terms of the voice, you think in terms of, the, of, 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 of what, she's going to be wearing, you think in terms of her gestures, um, and, and then gradually pull the whole thing together and think of her personality, what, what, how she would appear to other people. And, and then it's all gradually, bit by, it's, it's, a bit like, it's a bit like tiny, tiny tesserae, putting all these little pieces together until the mosaic is whole. Fascinating, and I'll maybe go to George at the back there. Yeah, that's, yeah. Sorry, a related question about the process of you reading a script and making decisions about how to play a character. Uh, do your interpretations change with time when you revisit, say, Medea? I'm afraid I don't know how many times you have re reprised the role. Well, I, 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 in the old day, in those days, um, <laughs> actors actually mostly actors, famous actors, would revisit Hamlet, Lear, uh, uh, they, they'd revisit the, big, the biggies. Nowadays, they very seldom do. Ian McKellen, I see, is revisiting Lear, and good for him, because it, it, it's gotta help if you've played it once over. Um, and uh, uh, I, I paid Phaedra, but in two different capacities. The first was uh, an addition by, by adaptation by Tony Harrison. 
and the second one was by Ted Hughes. And they were both very, very different. I mean, the, the Hughes was quite astonishing. It was very sort of muscular. It was amazing. And I met Ted Hughes, and, um, and we talked about... I mean, this is one of the joys of my profession, is meeting the writers. I mean, it's a huge privilege. And I look upon it as a huge privilege to have met and worked with Ted Hughes. And I got him to change a word in Fed, I wouldn't have dared to ask for anything else. But when Fed hears that uh, her stepson is in love with, uh, what is she called? Can anybody remember? No, I can't. Anyway, her stepson is in love with this other young girl. In the French edition, she goes, quoi? And Ted Hughes did a perfect translation. He wrote, what? And I said, you know, in the English language, it's going to bring the house down. There's all this sturm und drang going on, and she goes, what? <laughs> Much like Edith Bracknell, um, in, in Edith playing Lady Bracknell. And he uh, changed it to her name, because qua is fascinating. You can be sick on the word, can't you? It's at the back of your throat. You can make it sound as if she just is about to vomit. And he changed it to the name of the girl, whose name, I'm sorry, the story loses all impact, because I can't remember her name. But anyway, I could string the word out to the same effect. And that was so interesting that he took it. He took it from an actress, this, this lauded, uh, wonderful poet. And that's what this business is about. If it's not about collaboration, it doesn't exist. Perfect. Any, any more questions at all? Yes, down, down here. It's trying to sort of... Oh, there, now I can hear myself. Um, in theatre, it feels like we spend a lot of our days trying to sort of capture transitory moments between people. Um, and I was just wondering what are the sort of ways that you've picked up over your career to pick up those moments and to capture transitory moments between you and whoever you're playing opposite? Well, they're not so transitory if you're playing eight times a week and twice on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Do you know what I mean? Um, what happens is that, and this is another wonderful quality of the theatre, is that you, you, you really do bond uh, uh, um, with each other uh, uh, and amongst yourselves um, because you rely upon each other. You, you need each other. Um, I remember once I, I playing at the National and um, this young director came along and wanted us to play trust games. Well, at the risk of being ornery, I didn't point out to him. I played his trust games. Um, but stepping on stage with somebody is, if nothing else, the surest sign of trust. And it's wonderful playing between, you know, if you get somebody who, who does play with you, it's the most exciting thing in the world. It's really wonderful. And if you've got a good scene, uh, it, it's terrific. And you can read it in each other's eyes as well. You know, you read each other. Uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a very, very... Uh, um, it, it, it's a complicated form of intimacy. Real intimacy. Perfect. Um, just down here, if that's OK. Hello. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you worked with the great uh, Ted Hughes, uh, and I'm just wondering if there was anyone uh, who you found yourself a, a quite starstruck by, um, or whether you were just a bit too practical for that. I am practical, you're right. <laughs> but um, I am also capable of being starstruck. Um, yeah, I was completely starstruck by him. Uh, um, we went fishing together because he knew I liked fishing and he liked fishing. And there's nothing more wonderful than, than, than going fishing with, with um, the poet laureate. I can tell you his fishing box was a mess. 
but um, it was great. The other person I was completely starstruck with was, was um, uh, um, Arthur, who's the American? Arthur, I'm having Arthur. Miller? Miller. Miller. Uh, I was, um, yeah. Uh, he was getting an award for something, and I was in America at the time, and I wasn't giving him the award, but I was, I'd been asked there. And they got us there early, so I suggested we went and had a drink, and we did, sat down and had a glass of white wine each, and it was absolutely fascinating, because I was able to ask him something which I, you know, we've all seen Arthur Miller plays, we've seen the films, you know, what, a, what an extraordinary uh, uh, output he has. And I, I said, do, do, you, do you mind, oh, you must be so bored with people asking you questions, but do you mind my asking you this question? Because your plays have been played time and time and time again, and you haven't seen them in every manifestation, but you've seen the opening, and you must have seen one quite recently. And what is the difference in performance between what you saw originally and what you are seeing now? And there was a bit of a pause, and he looked at me and he said, in a rather weary tone, personality. And I realized that he was talking about actors whose performances, whose personalities, step into the part as opposed to the part stepping into their personality. And what sadness that must be. And also, years ago, I was doing research for a, a book that came out. Uh, it was Ibsen witnessing a play that he'd seen, a play of his. And somebody was with him and writing about what he witnessed. And it said, Ibsen grasped the orchestra rail in front of him and closed his eyes and groaned, oh God, oh God, oh God which is a perfect example of a poor playwright seeing a really lousy adaptation of his play. I think we've got about five minutes or so, so we'll just try and take a few questions. I can see that person at the front's been waiting for a while. So. Thanks very much. Um, this isn't really a question, but as was probably obvious, I'm Spanish, and I'm delighted to Oxygen. find... <laughs> yeah, um, just, just to perfect that, if you were talking about yourself as a woman, it would be oxidada. Just oh, to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and Thank you. <laughs> no problem if you ever need any Spanish on here. No. Um, continuing on the Spanish theme, have you read um, Garcia Lorca's The House of Bernardo Alba? Yes, and I have. So have you read his essay on uh, Duende? Yeah. That. Isn't it wonderful? It's wonderful. Garcia Lorca. <laughs> so, what do you is think? Is it Duende if it's a woman? No, it's Duende. Now, um, would duende. you tell me what Duende means, please? Dwarf, funnily what? enough. Dwarf. Wall? Dwarf. Door? No, dwarf. <laughs> dwarf. Snow White. Tyrion. Tyrion Lannister. <laughs> there there, there is that. no, but, but there is no equivalent in, in, in England. We have no Duende. No. It's a tip but it's when not about it's not about floor. It's about what comes up from the floor. It's it is, isn't it? It is. I mean, he's weird. Dwarf. A dwarf. A dwarf. A dwarf. A dwarf. Snow White. As in, Tyrion. as Snow in White. Tyrion Lannister. <laughs> as, <laughs> a dwarf. Yeah, a dwarf. Yeah. We're not naming no names here. No, 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 no. <laughs> Tell me, why is it dwarf when he's talking about equality in performance? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. I mean, I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> okay, on. <laughs> Out at the back there. You mentioned Dean McKellen a little while ago, and there was a famous picture that came out of him acting in, I think, The Hobbit, where he was acting against a green screen and supposedly in tears. Um, Having spent so much time on the stage and clearly loving it so much, and having also been in one of the largest productions in recent years, but one that's focused and, in my opinion, largely succeeded with uh, CGI and the use of it very um, graphically and imaginatively, how have you found that transition um, in the business towards a more computer-generated world? And 
do you sympathize somewhat with Ian McKellen in that photo, or do you think it's been a successful addition? Well, thank God I've never had to act in front of a green screen. I really would cry. Um, because that's asking a very great deal of, of actors and actresses. Um, we're supposed to create the illusion, not have the illusion created behind us. But there you go. Anyway, um, it has to move forward. It has to. Uh, I, I very much... Uh, virtual reality is, is on our doorstep. Are they going to take over from us? I don't know. I, I think probably um, in, in terms of my business, um, not for a very long time, but maybe at some point, uh, I, I would be deeply sad, but I'll be well under the sod by that time. I think we've got... We're going to take one more down here. So a final one down here. A question about stage, because you mentioned you're going to Broadway, but will we be able to see in London? Are you planning on doing more stage in London? And if you could choose a play, is there a play you always wanted to do but haven't done yet? I, I'd, I'd love to do a play in, in London. I'd really love to. I get offered um, Oscar Wilde a lot, which I find a bit depressing. <laughs> um, I would love a new play, but I'm being really greedy because I've done two, I did, in, in them there are days, uh, two new stoppards. Um, you know, the first Fedor was commissioned for me, the second Fedor and the Madeira. I've had my fill, I think. I've been very, very, very lucky. Um, I'd like to keep on trucking because um, as long as I'm on stage, I'm alive. <laughs> I think that just about calls our hour to an end um, on, on a very nice note there. So, oh, sorry, I got a bit morbid. So, uh, <laughs> but I meant looking to the future, um, obviously, with, with potential options. But, um, so I'd like, I, I enjoyed that immensely. So, can we all join together and give Dame Diana a massive round of applause? Thank you very much. Perfect. Head out, I'll, I'll say. Perfect. And just one thing. Perfect. And can I just add one more, one more, one more thing, one more thing before we before we head out? Just to let you know about what's going on at the union later this week. So tomorrow we've got our women in sports panel, which features three uh, leading names in female sport discussing the future of sport in the UK which should be really interesting. And we've got our environment debate featuring Natalie Bennett, um, the leader of the Green Party, on Thursday. Uh, we're also about to announce three or four uh, really exciting new names who are going to be coming later on this term, so keep your eyes peeled for that. It should be coming fairly soon. In terms of leaving now, if I could ask you all just to stay seated for the time being um, whilst Diana and I and the front row go. And once again, it'd be great if we could give uh, Dame Diana a big Cambridge goodbye as she leaves. Thank you, so right. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for that. Oh, perfect. <laughs>